so I've been talking about this clip. I, I think Sheldon White, Whitehouse did a great job on this. And uh, since uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, uh, we are going to hear, uh, obviously, tonight uh, from both candidates. Um, ABC News uh, is... Uh, NBC News head Cesar Conde says, we share in the frustration that our event will initially air alongside the first half of ABC's broadcast with Vice President Biden. Our decision is motivated only by fairness, not business considerations. I'm not sure I understand that concept. Uh, it's the American public who are going to lose out here. Uh, but um, let's, uh, we got time for this clip. All right, so let, cue up this clip, Brendan. I'm going to talk over it a little bit, and maybe we can cut back to me. This is Sheldon Whitehouse. He has just had this exchange where he is explaining to Amy Coney Barrett, who apparently did not know this, the Supreme Court, there is no code of ethics for the Supreme Court. There is no statutory code of ethics. There are for lower courts. There are for members of Congress. There are members uh, for members of the administration. Statutory obligations to reveal and be transparent about who's paying you for certain things, uh, what you can and cannot do, how you must recuse yourself. That does not exist for the highest court in the land. And after talking about that, Sheldon Whitehouse, and suggesting that maybe he and Lindsey Graham will offer legislation to that effect, he goes into this. And this is very important. It's a little bit long. I'm going to break it up and explain to you what's going on. But this is very important for you to understand how these cases are going to make it to the Supreme Court now and what's going to happen to so many of the things that we take for granted in our material lives. You've got that potentially coming uh, your way. So I flagged that for you. Uh, the second thing, another topic I'd like to raise with you is um, you've repeatedly mentioned during this hearing the phrase about um, litigation winding its way up uh, through the courts and ultimately to the Supreme Court. And you've described that process of winding its way as a important restraint on judicial activism. That you've got to wait till a court gets, a case gets to you in the ordinary course, correct? Correct. That's a fair description of where you've been? Correct. Yeah, and the... Oh, what happened? I know we're going a little fast. It's fine. We can, keep it, uh, we can keep the sped up. That's fine. A person. Right? Correct. And that person feels an injury? Yes. And then that person goes to a lawyer? Yes. And then that lawyer goes on their behalf to court? And files a complaint. And files a complaint. All right, guys, I'm not seeing any picture. So in court, closet, they try to speed, speed it back up. You can speed it back up, but I'm not seeing any picture. Oh, shit. Oh, one second. Hold on. Hang in there with us, uh, folks. Just a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. I mean, this is um, he, uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse is is basically saying that she has said, you know, this concept of of a, of a case winding its way through court. That you know, someone's wronged, they go to court, it works its way up through the district court and then the circuit court, and it's appealed, and then maybe it makes it to the Supreme Court. It, it makes it seem like it's happenstance. And Whitehouse is making the argument here that this is not only is it not happenstance, there are concerted efforts to bring about uh, cases. And not only are there concerted efforts to bring about cases, there is a communication between the justices where they are hunting for cases so that they can attack certain doctrines that have existed in our law, in some instances, for decades. Do we have it, Brandon? Yes. Okay, let's play it. You can speed it up a little bit. It's fine. To a lawyer? Yes. And then that lawyer goes on their behalf to court? And files a complaint. And files a complaint. And then in court, they try to win and vindicate their injury. That's kind of the basic standard way in which this works. Yes. So it gets a little weird sometimes. And that's a circumstance I'd like to bring up to you because it touches on some of the stuff that I addressed yesterday. Um, one case, let me, it's not even a case. Let me call, you know Janice. Yes. Okay, let's describe this as the Janice saga because it's more than really one case. And it's really about a completely different case called Aboud. You're familiar with the Aboud decision? Yes. So the Aboud decision was precedent for what, 40 years? Uh, I can't remember when Aboud was decided, but Pause it was precedent it for one before second. Janice. Yeah, and roughly. I'm going to try and go quick here. We don't have too much time. The idea that she doesn't know exactly how long is very, very odd to me. She may not know about the Abood case. It was from 1977. It was Abood v. Detroit. It basically said that public sector workers 
that a, a union shop, public sector workers can work in a union shop. And even if you're not a member of the union, you still need to pay union agency fees so that, th that you're paying for them to represent all the workers because they got to pay for lawyers and they do all the negotiating on your behalf. That is a booed 1977, very famous case. If you, if you tap me on the shoulder and said, when was a boot? I would have said it was probably in the seventies, but she seems not to know that. 40 years, I'll tell you. Um, and had repeatedly been reaffirmed. It was a longstanding precedent. Yeah, on which there was considerable reliance. Um, let's see. So Janice did overrule that precedent, and so Janice did go through the application of the stare decisis factors in deciding whether to overrule it. Right. Rather that and there, had, there was, in fact, reliance in the 40 years that it had been the law of the land on the question of the, the union question um, that it had resolved. Um, well, I don't want to... Second guess I don't or think she knows what a boot is. Praise the majority so, in Janice's of course there was reliance. I'm asking you as Unions a matter of fact, had agency plus states for 40 years based um, upon this. Well, Senator, I think reliance and the degree of reliance on a boot okay. is a legal question. We'll just leave that then. So uh, the, uh, the Janice saga question. begins actually with a case called Knox, in which um, Justice Alito um, took a shot at a boot. Um, he criticized it as substantially impinging upon First Amendment rights of union members. Just to, for people who are watching, the Abood case was about the right of a labor union to get compensated, not dues, but just compensation from non-members when in their representation of their members, they get added benefits for the people who are not members. So not the most exciting part of the law, but settled this question of when labor unions could get compensated for work they do for non-members. But Justice Alito did not like it. He took a shot at it in Knox versus SEIU. And the um, concurrence in that case said, whoa, wait a minute. Quote, the majority's choice to reach an issue not presented by the parties, briefed or argued, disregards our rules. Pause it for one Leo second. Like something about the Abood point is, Knox was about union dues, not agency fees. And to bring in agency fees in the context of a legal case, you are really, you're really stretching. Like this, this is not at issue here. The Supreme Court always deals with stuff that is very narrowly tailored. And to bring this other stuff, set off an alarm bell with the people, uh, with the, the other Supreme Court justices. Why would you bring this up? That's an odd, I mean, it's, it's tangentially related, but it has nothing to do with the disposition of this case. Continue. So he took that shot. Then we went on to a later decision called Harris v. Quinn. Alito took another shot at Abood in that case, describing Abood as having analysis that is questionable. He undertook an extended critique of the decision, describing it as having questionable foundations. Justice Kagan spotted that, and in her dissent, she said, today's majority cannot resist taking pot shots at Abood, uh, and described its critique of Abood's foundations as gratuitous dicta. But the message went out from Judge Alito that he wanted to do something about Abood. There was something about Abood that he did not like. And with that, we went to, that's the prequel. Then we went to the two cases that followed. Um, the first one was Friedrichs, which was supposed to be the case that got rid of Abood. And it had an interesting travel um, because the lawyer in the case was one of these groups from Janus. It was the Center for Individual Rights right here, who was counsel. In Janus, the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation was counsel. So they switched, right? In Friedrichs, Center for Individual Rights was counsel. Counsel, National Right to Work, was an amicus. When it went on to Janus, they switched. National Right to Work Legal Foundation, Defense Foundation was uh, counsel, and Center for Individual Rights was an amicus. Um, and from everything that I see, it looks like they actually went out and found the plaintiff. So back to our earlier discussion, it wasn't the injured person that went and hired a lawyer. It was the legal group that went and found uh, a plaintiff. Um, and then they went to court, which everybody does. But it got interesting there because uh, there the lawyers asked to lose. I don't know if you've ever been in a case in which the lawyers asked to lose before. I never have been. I've never litig litigated against anybody who asked to lose. Have you ever been in a case in which a party asked to lose? Um, no, I don't think I've ever experienced that. Yeah, I can, ima <laughs> I can imagine not. Um, so these groups with all this money behind them from Donors Trust and Bradley okay, Foundation. Okay, let's cut out of this uh, liberally because we've got to wrap court, things up here. And they say, But the please, bottom line is White House has now shown how Alito called through sort of bringing in another element for cases to come up through the system 
so that he could attack the right of unions to get paid for their representation of everybody in a shop. And White House is also listing how the all of the people representing the plaintiffs in this, all the entities, were basically the same entities. They were getting money from the same places. They would put a different name on who was going to actually litigate the case and who was just going to write an amici brief, which is, or uh, amicus brief, which is basically just a legal work that is put into the argument, sort of basically deputies, if you will, that ostensibly come from outside who might have a, a thing to say about a case. But in this instance, they didn't really come from outside because they're getting funded by the same people. And White House is basically, I don't know if he's doing it just uh, for our benefit. Perhaps it could be in part for Amy Coney Barrett's uh, benefit. But he is basically explaining something that is deeply, deeply corrupt in our system now. Money. And it, it, not only this mass amount of money that is going to, on one hand, spending tens of millions of dollars to make sure that Kavanaugh gets on the court, tens of million dollars that make sure that Amy Coney Barrett gets on the court, money that you cannot determine where it's from. Then also starts to feed up cases to these justices. And today in the hearing, uh, White House said he is going to, to dig deeper into this. So keep your eyes open for that. 